I would put myself in the same category as D-Wade. I mean, at the end of the day, the only thing that he have that I don't have is, you know, more wins than two championships. But as far as playing on the same level, competing every night, both ends, shoot inside, outside, fast break, transition, Montella have it all. Montella have it all. Montella have it all. The only way to get the trade started was to let them start talking about Steph Curry. That's like going fishing. You throw some bait out there. A couple of things happen with that. I wanted to switch the deal over to Monte all along, but in order to get a conversation going, we had to do that. There was a time when everybody loved the Warriors. Before they became a dominant powerhouse, they were a mediocre team that was only popular within the Bay Area. Those teams were led by Monte Ellis, an exciting, flashy young player who unfortunately never led the Warriors anywhere. In fact, he's probably remembered for being traded away from Golden State for Andrew Bogut. This trade, while very unpopular with the fans at first, turned out to be the greatest trade Golden State would ever make. It allowed Steph Curry to have the full reins on offense and unleash his ultimate potential. Some say Ellis was holding the team back. It's quite fascinating how the same player who was endeared for years in keeping Golden State afloat was actually the guy they needed to get rid of to become a championship contender. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today we're going to talk about Monte Ellis, the bridge between the We Believe era and the Steph Curry era. When Ellis came into the NBA, he was one of the last players to come straight out of high school. The 2005 draft was the last year where high school players were eligible to declare for the draft, and Ellis was the 40th overall pick. He was thrown onto a team that didn't really have any sense of direction. They had Jason Richardson, who was the face of their franchise, but he has yet to lead the Warriors to the playoffs. They got Baron Davis from a trade a year prior, and at the time, he wasn't seen as a winning player either. You add on a couple of lottery picks in Troy Murphy and Mike Dunleavy Jr., but both of them were not improving as much as they hoped. They had Derek Fisher as well. It was a team full of misfits. And Ellis, being the 40th overall pick, wasn't expected to do much of anything. In his rookie season, he barely played, averaging 7 points in 18 minutes a game. The following year, however, the 2006-7 season, would be the year the Warriors would make history. Because of an injury to Jason Richardson, Ellis got a lot more minutes, and he took full advantage of this opportunity. He started in 53 games, averaging 16.5 points and 4 assists per game. This was the year that Monte started to develop into the Monte we all know and love. He showed off his flashy dribbling, his insane quickness and speed, his ability to contort his body in midair and make shots at the rim at will. Being from Mississippi, he became known as the Mississippi Bullet. His playstyle and body type was similar to Allen Iverson, and his game reminded a lot of folks of AI in his prime. He was light, he was agile, he had the same quickness, although his handles were not as crisp. But at just 21 years old, he was looking really nice. A huge steal for being a 40th pick. The Warriors would make history in the 2007 playoffs. While the 8th seed has defeated the 1 seed before, this was the first time it happened in a 7 game series. Ellis did not play well in his first playoff run, but because he showed so much promise in the regular season, the future was looking bright for the Warriors. They found their franchise player of the future. Unfortunately, little did he know, this would be his first and only playoff run in a Warriors jersey. The next few years for Ellis were filled with highs and lows. By his third season, he became the second leading scorer on the team, now averaging over 20 a game. Believe it or not, he used to be a very efficient player. In that season, he shot 53% overall from the field, and made 68% of his shots at the rim. That percentage at the rim is really, really good, especially for a smaller guard. For comparison, James Harden shoots 64% at the rim for his entire career, and in his prime, he was known as one of the best finishers ever. Back in his early days, Ellis used to relentlessly attack the rim, and that's where most of his points came from. He was primarily a shooting guard, but he could play point guard in a pinch. Although his court vision and passing were nothing special, he was not a natural passer. 
Anyway, despite leading the Warriors to 48 wins in the following season, they still missed the playoffs, cause you know, <laughs> it's the West. It was a hyper-competitive conference. This is where his career took a turn for the worse. In the summer of 2008, a month before signing a huge contract, Ellis had a severe ankle injury. The doctors found out that he tore a ligament there, and originally Ellis told the team that he got injured while working out, but it was soon discovered that was not the case. He actually got injured because of a moped accident, which was a breach of contract as it's considered a dangerous activity. As a result, the Warriors suspended him for 30 games, and plus you add on the games he missed due to the injury, and it was a very bad, very short season for him. Ellis ended up playing only 25 games, and the Warriors were terrible, winning just 29 games the entire season. Fast forward a few months later to the 2009 draft. The Warriors would draft a guy who would change the franchise forever. It's funny how the domino effect works. If Ellis never got into that moped accident, he wouldn't have been injured and suspended. If he played the entire season, the Warriors would be too good to have a lottery pick, so they would have never gotten Curry. Oh, the domino effect never fails to amaze me. When Curry did get drafted, Ellis, though, he was kind of upset. After the draft, Ellis publicly said that they're not going to win that way. And at the time, it kind of made sense. They were both undersized guards with a score-first mentality. The Warriors' defense was already bad with Ellis in the backcourt, but now you add a young Steph Curry, it certainly didn't help their defense. Anyway, the next two seasons saw Ellis change up his game a lot. He started driving to the rim a lot less, and started settling for way more jump shots. He was not a great three-point shooter, but he was a good mid-range shooter. The problem is, being a good mid-range shooter is still inefficient compared to other ways to score. From 2009 to 2011, he had the highest scoring seasons of his career. He averaged 25 points a game, but his efficiency was not the same as it was before. Some say it's because of that moped injury that sapped a lot of his explosiveness and quickness. Eventually, in the middle of the 2011-12 season, Ellis would get traded to Milwaukee for Andrew Bogut, a trade that was heavily criticized by Warriors fans everywhere, to the point where they even booed their owner, Joe Lacob, during Chris Mullen's jersey retirement ceremony. That's how much the fans loved Monte. The trade discussions, as I mentioned earlier, were kind of interesting. Initially, the Warriors had Curry in the discussion. They were trying to see what they could get for Curry, but the front office was just fishing. They were using Curry's name to get a foot in the door to start the negotiations, but they would always switch the conversation to Monte Ellis. Ellis was the guy they wanted to trade away. And at this time, the perception of Steph's incredible three-point shooting was not valued in the same way it is today. Apparently, it's been said that the Warriors had a tough decision to make. They were still very hesitant on trading Ellis, but after six years of highs and lows, it was time to move on. In those years, they never even tried to build around him seriously. The front office just went through the motions, knowing that Ellis would never lead them to a title regardless, so they were waiting on getting the perfect player in the draft. A few years after getting Curry, in the 2011 draft, they got Clay Thompson, who was a legitimate two-guard, the perfect replacement for Ellis as Thompson could play at both ends, and they needed a bigger guard next to Curry. It was pretty obvious to Ellis at this time that he was gone. I mean, think about it. Why would the Warriors draft two guards in the lottery during Ellis's prime? It's obvious they were going to get rid of him. During those years, they only kept him around because he was entertaining, and he sold tickets. Fans came to the games to watch Ellis, because there was nothing else exciting about the team. It's a shame to say it like this, but Ellis was never going to be a warrior for life, even though he wanted to be. After getting traded to Milwaukee, he found himself in a similar situation, paired with another undersized score-first guard. And of course, once again, it did not work out. Fast forward a bit and he had a couple of bounce-back seasons in Dallas, making the playoffs both years and performing really well. Ellis was a huge reason why the Mavs pushed the eventual champion Spurs to seven games, even though he was still a great, great scorer, and was now with a better team, he had the same problems as before. It seemed like he never got many calls when driving to the basket. As great of a scorer as he is, he never drew that many fouls and that hurt his efficiency. In fact, that's probably the biggest knock on his game. He prefers to avoid contact as opposed to seeking it out. His smaller frame plays a role too. 
He's not strong or sturdy enough to get constantly banged in the paint, so he tries to avoid contact whenever possible. In the twilight years of his career, he spent his last two seasons in Indiana, where he was unspectacular and clearly nowhere near his former self. At the age of 31, he was out of the NBA. So how good was Monte Ellis actually? He was very exciting, and for fans who grew up during that era, they all have a soft spot for Monte Ellis. He's also, in my opinion, probably the best player in NBA history to never make an all-star team. Despite not leading the Warriors anywhere, he brought hope and excitement to a franchise that's been struggling for years. After his ankle surgery from that moped accident, he never truly recovered, and his game slowly regressed. At times, he looked uncomfortable driving to the basket, even though this was supposed to be his strongest asset. And during an era where the NBA started to move towards analytics, Ellis, with all his mid-range jumpers and poor three-point shooting, did not adapt. It'll be interesting if he got drafted to the NBA today. I wonder if his game will be completely different, and could he be an actual all-star level player? Do you think the Warriors still could have won a championship if he was still on that team, instead of trading for Bogut? Let me know in the comments, thank you all so much for watching, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.